program of this week or in the field of cancer, this is the toughest one. So um, you can ask questions in the middle if you get lost. Because what happens, I've skipped over a lot of slides uh, because we want to finish it in one hour instead of two hours. And uh, of all, everything that we talked about, like you know, cell cycle regulation or growth factor regulation, this was the tough part. This is the toughest one. But we try to go as easy as possible. We'll skip very complicated slides. There is no sense in really going into too much into the regulation part. We'll just kind of skip over a few things and try to explain a little bit more as, as we go along. Uh, one uh, another thing I wanted to mention was um, that if you have, if you guys have any questions, like not right now, afterwards, or if you need any suggestions from me in uh, in terms of your, you know, experimental designs, interpretations, anything that you need, uh, just don't don't hesitate to write. Um, you can write to me on the email address that I provided, but I can give you another one. You know, just for Gian. I had made a different Gmail uh, address uh, just for this, so that that one says that RGM, which is my name, RGM are my initials. Dot science at gmail.com. Okay. So it's pretty simple, but I think that it's important because what happens is many times I get so much junk mail in the folder, so I delete. And many times I accidentally delete some emails, and you know I might do that in this case. So you don't want to do that, okay? So write on rgm.science at gmail.com. Okay, let's start. See, angiogenesis, invasion, and metastasis. All three, these three aspects are extremely important for a, for a cancer cell to go and metastatize at a distant organ. And one of the things to remember is cancer doesn't kill you. It's the metastasis that kills people. So you have to understand metastasis. Cancer can be removed. You know, as soon as it's found, the physician can go in, take this, do the surgery, give chemotherapy, everything is curable. But by the time that's all done, um, it's too late because the cells may have already gone to its distal site. And you don't know where it has gone in the body. And by the time it comes up in the body, there are other organs which are also showing up. And it's you know, messes up all the metabolism and everything else in the body. Okay, so let's start now. Okay, so uh, this this uh, area of research has flourished so dramatically that majority of the papers that came out are in cell or in science and nature, New England Journal of Medicine, nature, 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 review, nature review. So it has it has received a lot of importance in the uh, in the last several or you know, last fifteen years. Now the slides that I have are you know I haven't updated in the last couple of years, so they are older. But uh, I think if you learn this much, I'll be very happy. It's it's much uh, much more complex than that. Okay. So angiogenesis. The definition of angiogenesis is that. It, it, it's the generation of new blood vessels through sprouting of from originally existing blood vessels in the process um, involving migration, proliferation of endothelial cells of pre-existing vessels. Where, so you have to remember two words, angiogenesis and vasculogenesis. Vasculogenesis is a normal blood cell, uh, that I mean the blood uh, vessels growing. When vascular genesis occurs, there are no pre-existing blood vessels. So angiogenesis happens like a branch from the existing blood vessel. The vasculogenesis, the word, we won't be using this anymore. We'll be focusing on angiogenesis. Means new blood vessel formation from the existing blood vessels. So the, uh, this chart here, we don't have to remember too much about it, but what happens is from in the embryological situation, you have a hemangioblast and that becomes the hematopoietic precursor. Either the blood cells are made or the lymphocytes are, lymphocytes are made or you have the, uh, uh, the blood vessel formations, which are eventually, you know, they are going to be a, uh, a 
both the you know, different organs, the blood vessels providing the blood to the brain and uh, which are very narrow, all these are normal. One of the things that you really want to remember in all this process is everywhere VEGF is involved, VEGF. VEGF is um, a vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF. VEGF is extremely important in the, in the field of cancer as you as we progress take this slowly, you will realize that that is one of the most important part in the process of, uh, of metastasis uh, in general. What happens is that the question is whether, whether the angiogenesis occurs normally in healthy human. Because when somebody says that angiogenesis is a process only that happens in the cancer, once the cancer is formed, then the question is does the angiogenesis happen in the in healthy healthy humans and the answer is yes during the embryological development the angio new blood vessels form because you have one main vessel and the little branches come out to provide blood to various uh, various organs as they develop you know wound healing like if you have a cut and the new blood vessels are formed that's not vasculogenesis that's angiogenesis because that has to come as a branch from the existing blood vessel and then in the uh, when the uterine uh, wall is disrupted that is, that is reformed and that's where again the angiogenesis is a normal normally occurring phenomenon so that question the answer is that yes angiogenesis does occur in, in healthy human beings the angiogenesis uh, has a um, uh, two phenomena either it could be excessive angiogenesis or it could be insufficient angiogenesis. So when you have excessive angiogenesis, it's related to many diseases which include cancer, AIDS, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, blindness, psoriasis, all those have the excessive angiogenesis. If you have a insufficient angiogenesis, uh, that happens in stroke, ulcers, and infertility, and so on. So cancer is a, since we are talking about cancer, cancer is a, a disease which is happening because of excessive uh, angiogenesis and not because of shortage of angiogenesis. Uh, this one is not, this is just, you know, a hallmark, we won't go into that. So if you look at a picture, then the normal, if you look at normal colorectal tissue because uh, you see a well organized pattern and the blood vessels are there. If you look at the uh, cancer in the colon, you can see the uh, newly formed ducts which are like all over the place. So that's because of the heavy duty angiogenesis. The reason that you need to have angiogenesis is because the tumor cell needs supplies. And it needs more supplies than the regular cells. And the supply is going to come from the blood. So you have to really provide them with blood. The blood is, uh, the more blood, more nutrient is going to come as you have more angiogenic process occurring. So that's the major reason that, that the angiogenesis actually does happen. Uh, in a process from increasing angiogenesis, if you go from normal duct to a hypercrestic uh, duct as we, uh, as we were discussing before, we go through dysplasia, we go through the angiogenic uh, CIS. So the red dot you see are the blood vessels. So if you have you know, very, very few blood vessels, the blood vessels increase as we go into the, from dysplasia to the angiogenic uh, process. Uh, and then this dysplasia becomes more aggressive. Once it gets to be a tumor, you have a very high uh, amount of blood supply that's, uh, that's occurring. So, uh, as, as the progression occurs from normal to cancer, your angiogenetic process is going to increase. And it doesn't matter which kind of tumor it is, the, whether it's a um, breast cancer or it's a cervical cancer or it's a colon cancer. The only thing is slow growing tumors will have less angiogenic process as compared to the fast growing tumor. So these are all very very logical uh, sequences. It does not have any, uh, you know, anybody can really guess it and it will be right. That okay, you know, this tumor is big, it grew big because it, it you know, it had a lot of nutrients 
and it got the blood from you know continuous supply, lots of blood vessels. So it had a lot of angiogenesis, and the other one had little angiogenesis, right? So, what happens is, whether it's critical or not, and then this, this was taken from one of the reviews, and if you look at the normal avascular tumor, you just have a tumor, it has no blood supply, this tumor is going to be necrotic and die. If you, in a malignant tumor, you have an angiogenic switch. Now, angiogenic switch, meaning there are growth factors, that's going to uh, turn on the angiogenesis process, okay? So that switch has to be coming from a growth factor, and that growth factor is VEGF. VEGF provides you that stimulus so that the cells can enhance the uh, angiogenesis process. So more angiogenesis occurs because of VEGF. So if you look at this here, so you have an angiogenic switch, and next, next one I will show. This is this is shown more like a dramatically. I mean, it's not you know, it's not really. This is not what happens, but they are shown like that. Then once a lot of EGF is secreted, you have the uh, tumor becomes very vascularized, and then you have the uh, <coughs> intravascularization occurring. It goes inside the tumor cells. And then it sends, uh, uh, you know, the micrometastasis occurs because then what happens is that the blood vessels are going to go and uh, supply blood to the uh, organ where the tumor cell has gone, and the tumor. Cell in the distant organ because once it's there the new oh, so my voice is like loudspeaker okay this is a great big subject. So what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to give you lots of words, lots of definitions, but I won't go into too much detail because we have no time and I think that detail is going to be the material overload in the brain. It's not, it's not going to work. So I, I was really struggling with what to say and what not to say for this lecture. So you have a hypoxia occurring. Now if you look at a cancer, it, cancer in the, in the middle of the cancer, you're going to have a necrosis. The necrosis occurs... What's going on? What should we do? What should we do? Oh, just escape it. Okay, that's good. Focus. So what happens is in the middle of the tumor, you always have a necrosis, like you know the tumor, the cells are dying, it becomes like a crud. So there is a process called hypoxia, that means the, there is an oxygen gradient, there is a less oxygen in the center and outside there is a lot of oxygen. So the oxygen ingredient, that lack of oxygen here is going to cause the uh, hypoxic condition. And the hypoxia uh, is, is also dependent on a factor called HIF1 alpha or a hypoxia induced uh, growth factor. So if you look at the hypoxia, the, uh, uh, what does hypoxia do, I mean HIF do? It, it has the normal tissue as well as tumors to survive under hypoxic conditions. So when this, this factor is produced, it sort of uh, doesn't require oxygen anymore. It will say, okay, they will make the cells survive. And this, and your aim is not to have the cells survive. So you have to have something uh, that, that people have started making the uh, inhibitors of HIF-alpha for the tumors to kill. 
So it's you have to, it's, it's a negative logic in in the mind, right? Because HIF is going to going to make the cells survive in the absence of oxygen, and you really want to kill the cells in the absence of oxygen. So you have the uh, HIF. You want to get rid of the function of HIF alpha. Okay. And the way so it will work is that uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of that, but this is a complexing complex situation where uh, signaling occurs which connects it with with the oxygen to HIF alpha makes a complex and is going to have a ubiquitination meaning the uh, is going to be just getting it degraded don't worry about this chart because this chart is very complex I'm not going to go into that because it has a it has a lot, lot of regulation at a genomic level okay so what happens is <coughs> We will look at the fact as to what factors are involved in the uh, VEGF process. Uh, you have a, many growth factors involved. You have epidermal growth factor involved, FGF, cyclooxygenase, many oncogenes. All these factors in working in a coordinate way will make uh, VEGF release. You have a release of VEGF occurring. And that VGF is going to bind like any other growth factor when we are talking in a growth factor class to its surface receptor and it gets internalized with a phosphorylation and that's going to go uh, do the signaling downwards uh, into the nuclei to have the uh, angiogenesis occurring. It's going to um, induce and, and, and start making the new blood vessels. So all these these things are really regulated by VEGF. Um, that, that's the most important factor that that you have in the in the process of invasion or metastasis. What's VEGF? VEGF. Well, vascular. Right. Vascular endothelial growth, growth factor. Okay. And the signaling pathway of VEGF. We don't have to worry about it, but what we have to do is whether there are lots of VEGFs and they all have similar type of action. And in next next one, I will show you uh, what VEGFs do in general. But otherwise, you have the receptor, you have signaling cascade, and it is going to do either proliferation, lumen formation, or migration. And all these migrations meaning invasion. You have to go to the next cell. You have to go launch to the other uh, distant site. It's all regulated by VEGF. So VEGF is the most important growth factor in the process of uh, angiogenesis, invasion, and metastasis. Okay. So the question is, and and I, the, some of these I just kind of did recently because I wanted to make sure that I ask a question and then we answer short answer make a short answer. So is how do we know that VEGF is critical, right? So if you have a normal vas vascularization occurring in the in the body, it's normal vasculature. This is uh, before VEGF in v inhibition. So <coughs> there are a lot of drugs that are made that inhibit the VEGF activity. So if you have an anti-VEGF drug in the in your in this is some of them are done in vivo. Majority of these studies are done in vivo in the models. And if you have the after VEGF inhibition, you are going to have a less blood vessels as compared to before uh, VEGF. And this experiment can be done. I, I took that out. There were studies made where you can actually have the animals uh, that um, that either you in, uh, inject the drug into them and inhibit the, uh, the angiogenesis or you could have a knockout animal where angiogenesis doesn't occur and then you put the uh, tumor cells in the animals, you inject them the knockout animals will not develop tumor but your tumor will come in the animals that have the angiogenic process intact which will tell you that angiogenesis is the essential part for the tumor formation uh, this is just the number of tumor microenvironment different cells. We are not going to go into that, but it's very important to know that extracellular matrix, which is a, which constitutes the uh, basement membrane, 
which include all the fibers, fibronectin, laminin, collagen, etc., which makes our surface. That's the one which is uh, which is quite you know quite crucial in in terms of its uh, regulation. And um, I just wanted to throw the terms. This really don't. This slide is like out of nowhere. But yeah. Yes, there is. Uh, you, there are assess for the uh, angiogenetic uh, genesis inhibition. Now what happens is that there are models for that and uh, the that specifically induces, it, it usually is a uh, chicken, chick egg uh, model. So you have a chick egg and then you know they, because there are lots of vessels and those angiogenic process can be inhibited if you put an inhibitor in there and then you see whether uh, your, you know, your drug has a... Uh, we have a Google that we did the EGF of our uh, ABS also. Yes, of course. Our uh, the, Yeah, but, but the thing is that they, uh, they, they respond to the drugs. Your, your regulatory phenomenon of angiogenesis may be different. So if you are looking at the downstream signaling of VGF in avian system or human will be different. But when you look at the effect of a drug, then it will show you the activity of a VEGF inhibition. Yes. Okay. Now we'll talk about the cell invasion. So angiogenesis part is over, but we'll come back again when we when we again uh, you know combine everything together. So invasion, the difference between invasion and metastasis. Invasion is the movement of the cells to the neighboring cell. So like for example, if a tumor has occurred in the epithelial tissue, epithelial cell of, a, of an organ, say in case breast cancer, in the breast epithelial cells, then the cells will migrate into the neighboring cells, which are like a fat cells or it could be a, uh, you know, in, in the, um, uh, the cells that would constitute like fib fibr fibr fibric uh, status of the thing. Uh, you can in, in in colon it can go to the squamous cells. In, so the neighboring cell, whatever neighboring cell is there, uh, the the movement is is, a, is going to be called invasion. Yes. Uh, here I work with the uh, samples, uh, patient samples. So there is a core tissue, and then there is a invasion. Okay. So uh, uh, what I'm trying to say here is, what will be my control? Because uh, every time a doctor or surgically operates a uh, uh, tumor tissue, they take away some extra, uh, uh, you know, uh, surgically they remove some margins, extra so parts. Margins, margins. Yes. Yeah, margins they remove, right, sir? But in margins there could be a micro invasion, right, sir? So do I con uh, if I have to publish, do I consider margins as? Uh, uh, control or I, I cannot do that. No, the margin. What happens is in a, in, a, in a practical condition when a surgeon goes in and removes a tumor, they have to go and they process half an inch outside border and they try to take that tissue out. And then that tissue is immunocytochemically evaluated for the presence of uh, whatever the um, markers you have, a tumor specific markers. And if it shows up, then they'll go another half an inch. And then they will wait till the, they see that there is no more uh, expression of that marker in that margin. And then they'll go another half inch and that's where they stop. So that's how they, that's a normal procedure in surgery that they do. Can I, can I ask you this? Sir, I'm working with breast cancer. Uh, uh, human breast cancer. And when I was, uh, the markers may, may be negative. But when I uh, studied the telomerase activity, it was still there till the end, uh, to the last part of the marginal tissue. Telomerase so activity was there. Telomerase is active. That means is that's a, uh, that's your marker, right? Right. So I mean, what I'm saying is that the markers are decided by the lab, by the by the group, as to what they feel comfortable in their uh, under their situation. That okay, if I use this marker, I'm pretty much certain that I'm. I'm taking care of the margins. So that's what they do. Yeah. So now this is a little complex slide, but it's not that difficult. So what happens is we look at these steps involved in uh, cell invasion, and this is again a logic. You have the activation of endothelial cells. The endothelial cell, the cell has to detach, detachment from the neighboring cells, and then it will attach to the to the next cell on the 
the extracellular matrix. Then you have the it has to be degraded because it has to get inside, and then it uh, establishes a new structure. Now you can look at this a little bit, you know, as you go along. It does not have all it is is it's a normal epithelium is broken off. The cells are coming out. Is going to go invert into the new cells, and uh, there are a lot of mark, a lot of growth factors that are involved uh, involved in the process. This you have to study. This slide you have to study on your own because if I go into detail, it will be bogged down. So I'm going to move on. Uh, otherwise, I will be stuck here. Okay. What? One of the things that you have to remember is that the matter matrix matter of protein is uh, family or MMP matrix uh, matter of protein is is involved. In in lot of different regulations, you have the regulation of MMPs uh, for all your um, extracellular mat, mat proteins, and there are like 25 different varieties. But what I want to emphasize here is that some MMPs have a regulatory function, and some of them are inhibitories. So, for example, for growth, if you look at the MMPs and look at the numbers, some of them are going to enhance the growth. Some of them are going to inhibit the growth, and the reason I'm sh I, I put this kind of slide in, and that's true for like angiogenesis, invasion, immunity. The reason I put that in is because the drug companies are going to develop drugs that you want to enhance the inhibition, and you decrease the enhancement. So they will make drugs that would inhibit this, or they would make drugs. That would increase this inhibitor activity. So the whole strategy, your aim or a, or a drug making strategy, is is going through the target uh, target factor, target action. And in case of M there are lots of drugs that that uh, address MMPs, and this inhibition is enhanced or this is decreased. And there are different MMPs involved in the process of growth, survival. Angiogenesis, invasion, and so on, and uh, the numbers numbers mean a lot, but don't worry, it doesn't mean a lot to us right now because all it is is a difference in the homology, difference in some amino acid, uh, you know, differences within the structure of MMP, the size uh, size of MMP, all that will make a different structure, and there are 25 of them so far, and they keep on coming more and more. Another thing to remember is different MMPs are regulated by different growth factors. So you can you can go through that and you can figure out what uh, growth factors are involved in regulating uh, uh, what which, which MMP regulates which growth factor function. Okay. So bottom line then in this case is you have a MMPs and there is a balance. You have MMP and and TMP. Those are the inhibitors. So again, the TMP is going to uh, to reduce the uh, the action. They have to, to have a balance. MMPs are going to try to enhance the activity. So this that that works in coordination. So this is just like a cartoon showing you the balance between the between the two. Okay. Now this is a <laughs> this is a little bit complicated. So what happens is that a cell, when it has to go to in, when it has to do invasion, the cell has to move. Cell actually has to move. That this movement is uh, is really like mechanical engineering in a way. It's so sophisticated that the cells have a um, this this one here, for example, you know, like it has a tip. I want to show from here. So I can I can I can. Because when it comes at an angle, I cannot see. Um, okay. The way to do it is that you have the you have the extension of this lamino laminopodium, and you have a sub substratum. Now, in case of cultures, it's our cult culture basement, like the, you know, the coated cell surface in the uh, in the body. It's our uh, uh, when it's the epithelium that's broken off. And what this has, it is, it has a, um, it has a process by which this uh, this cell has a tip or the age group or leading leading group 
that moves up and here it has shown into little bit detail that they have a clutch which kind of make you know just like a car holds it moves the cell forward it has a leading edge which is very different and all the cells that follow that don't have leading edge so the only the leader only the leader the one that's in the front has the leading edge and then when the cell goes and moves in the second cell that's coming in the back is going to form a leading edge and go into that and that's all going to be regulated by your uh, re regulated by the signaling processes that are occurring uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know your your muscle contraction proteins like actin myosin and those are the ones that are involved in the process of progressing this cell into the forward direction and once the cell goes forward and there is a forward direction the backward is going to be a going to re, uh, kind of retract with the contraction and the cell is going to go move forward <coughs> so when this is a, now making up a bigger picture so you have this cell epithelial cells they have three different zones you have the tip cells they have stalk cells the phalanx cells and then this is a basement membrane right so if you look at that the cells the cell coming out to go during the invasion the migrating cells uh, they have the tip cells now those cells are regulated by different set of regulatory proteins than stalk cells or the phalanx cells which doesn't have much of a regulation but the tip cells are very important because that is going to design uh you know what is what they have to do to go forward okay and this is the regulation so for example for tip cell you have a regulation by vegfs and then these are all all these words they are all regulatory proteins uh, as as the intermediates of the pathway uh, which are the vgf pathway or the not pathways all these different pathways are in existence and vegf has been said before is important for survival for proliferation for migration now the tip cell here is uh, this one here is is uh, enhanced and shown how the internal activities occur how the energy source is going to occur how the gtp is going to be broken down where the energy comes from or how the vgf is going to function and we really cannot go into that so that's that's a little bit of a you know uh, little faster uh, faster moving process but this is important so if you have a, a normal mouse and if you i think i said i said that right okay without without the picture here is a picture so you have a normal mouse and you inject the uh, cancer cells in them and you going to have a tumor coming after some time if you have a angiogenesis deficient mutant mouse uh, you are going to have no cancer so here we the important point to remember is that in uh, i don't know i'm sure you have in india also but in united states it's a fashion to have a uh, knockout mouse work you work on knockouts and for your good paper so for example if i'm working on a Uh, estrogen receptor function estrogen receptor alpha function i'll use a estrogen receptor alpha knockout mouse so i can show that okay i'm saying that function x is because of estrogen uh, then if I, estrogen receptor alpha and the that function is eliminated by in my knockout mouse then it's a, it's a definite proof that 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 function is because of the er alpha so there are there are uh, institutes and nih is uh, making the knockout mice or gene over expressing mice uh, they make the uh, the trick just just diverging from it because this is more important for from a general perspective what happens is you can study the effect of a drug because all of you are interested in some sort of a drug on on a function by using either a reg knockout mouse or you can use a mouse where that gene is over expressed so that if it is over expressed you going to have a lot of effect of that so you can say okay that 
that's what's uh, happening you can also have a target deleted uh, mouse it means you have for example where the er alpha is not receptor not the er alpha er alpha receptor is not deleted through or is not a complete uh, knockout mouse but you have a your organ specific knockout knockout so you can they can knock out the receptor only in colon and then you can study and the third thing that they do is in the uh, you can do it in animals and you can do it in vitro is tat on tat off uh, system where they uh, have a gene that they will uh, have they tag it with a tetracycline uh, dependent uh, uh, responsive element so it will be turned on when you give tetracycline so that's uh, and then you have a reaction because the that that uh, that will turn on the gene so that's got tacked on and then you remove the tetracycline is turned off so what happens is in tat on tat off you can really <coughs> figure out whether whether that gene that you have tagged has a action that you think it does so you just turn it on and you see so in our studies yesterday i showed proliferate uh, those um, uh, the data on the uh, uh, on on pang studies to show the uh, uh, confocal microscopy and um, uh, you know with with our gene so those studies were done using a tat on tat off system so uh, so here we have the uh, study that i was just describing it to you the the result of the study i was talking about was the prohibitin yesterday the prohibitin studies that we were talking about uh, the uh, somebody in florida had made a tat on tat off uh, system for prohibitin so we kind of collaborated with them they sent us the cell line and then we studied studies we just turned on the prohibitin gene we turned off the prohibitin gene and you can look at the effect Okay. <clears throat> so in here, what we are talking about is about the drugs. That the drugs that are in the literature, for example, uh, this this one here, thaliamide. That's uh, that was used before. It's not used now. Now it's more like avastin and those kind of drugs are used. But what they try to do is that you have a cancer cell. and then they try the try to block like anti vg vgf antibodies and all these they are going to block the process here some of them are going to block the so it's all target target specific suppression or inhibition of the system and these are the drugs that have been uh, you know being developed for the uh, anti angiogenic uh, processes in the clinical trials uh, for cancer and some of the ones that are really important are the are the ones as i said that uh, thaliodomide or or endostatin and angiostatin and things like that so this oh here yeah, i summarized angiostatin avastin i just mentioned endostatin and this one i don't think this in clinic too much avastatin is the most popular one okay now in next 10 15 minutes we'll work on metastasis <laughs> so metastasis in the difference between invasion and metastasis is very simple everybody knows that metastasis goes to the distant organ and invasion is to the neighboring tissue and uh, this is just this this one is just to show that how the uh, angiogenic means your cancer cells are going to be taken with the blood or with the lymphatic system into the uh, distant organ and you have the uh, you have the metastasis occurring in a distant organ uh, the term of metastasis was used in 1829 or so and this is just a, this is not that important so this is just a history uh at introduction of nude mouse was done very early on 1950 1969 they develop nude mice now just a just couple of sentences about nude mice is uh, these are the mice they uh, they don't have thymus is they are athymic and so what happens is they have no immunity 
So majority, the one of the biggest problems in studying cancer or any organ in the normal uh, animals is the immunity is that the uh, foreign tissue is going to be rejected. So uh, you would have to study human cancer cell growth in the athymic or nude mouse. It's called nude mouse because it has no hair. And do you guys work with nude mice in uh, here? We're going to start, yeah. Okay. Because, all right. Okay. Because it, you have to have a company that supplies it. That's very difficult. One of the things you have to remember though, and I'll talk to you when you start your work, it's it's very critical. There's some, some things are very critical. You have to have a double entry. You enter, you close back, you go to the other room. You have to dirty and clean side. You have to have, uh, you know, your uh, mask. Because what happens is that if you have, you know, you sneeze and the dog, I mean, the mouse will catch the, uh, you know, will die. So you have to be very careful about protecting the animals. And those animals are pretty expensive. They come over 50 to $60 a piece. So it's, it's, it's very expensive study. But the nude mouse was developed uh, in those things. These are all different organs where, now I took out this slide but it showed up again. All it's trying to show that the reason that I, well, since the slide is in, I can tell you that there is extensive lymphatic system in the body and the tumors can go by this, by the, uh, can, I mean the cancer cells can go or progress using blood or also through the lymphatic system and then you have a huge very complex lymphatic system uh, here in the in, in the in this picture uh, we don't show this okay this one here is again the same process that i showed in angiogenesis that you're going to have the epithelial cell that's going to broke a break that's that's going to break go do invasion or do the metastasis and you're going to have the distant uh, tissue or uh, organ that's going to get the cells launched into that and here you have the summary of this given like you have a clonal cell expansion and then you have the, the subculture is, uh, is going to go the um, break the cells open and uh, and it's going to develop the angiogenesis make the cells grow faster and, and launch the tumor there this is all all is done using a system um, uh, which I'll go in next because I didn't know that this uh, this picture was there. So this one is the B16 melanoma. Uh, B16 melanoma is a cell line, which is a mouse derived cell line, but the metastasis uh, occurs very fast and the melanoma grows very fast. So this slide is shown that the tumors are heterogeneous and not all not all cells possess the same characteristic and to prove the point what they did is they took the animal with b16 melanoma cells in culture and divided them made the clones so there are many clones and then you inject the animals with with cells from different clones then they have some have metastasis some have fewer metastasis and some have no metastasis so that means that says that the the tumor, when you see like in the cell culture when we do, we have a monolayer cell culture, MCF7 cells or B16, it's all same cell. So one cell does the trick. In case of tumor, it's, it's very heterogeneous. And um, uh, so for example, that's one of the reasons that the therapies fail. So you have a mixture of cells in a tumor, you have a really good targeted, uh, targeted therapy you give the therapy to the patient, the tumor will start uh, regressing, but then you have provided the advantage for the cells that are not responding. Because those cells say that, okay, now I have more space to grow. So now you have a resistant cells that are going to grow like crazy. And that keeps on happening. While doing that, more mutations occur within the cell and it forms different clones of cells. In cell culture also that happens. For example, if you, uh, if you introduce a gene into, a, into your monolayer cell culture and then you start taking the clones, the expression uh, of uh, that particular gene in various clones that you've selected 
is different. It's not going to be the same. Some will have very high, some will not have any. And then you select the clone that has very high and then you dilute it out and start out again with one or two cells by just dilution and then let them grow. And then, then you have a, uh, then you can make a cell line out of that. So, uh, we will not read all this. It's not very easy, but uh, but you do it. So what happens? The way you do is you have a you take a tumor that you get from the surgery, and then you chop it up. You smash it up, almost like a liquid type of uh, phase. You put it in culture, and then uh, overnight, some cells you can see them breaking out, and then you start uh, removing the rest of it, and then let them grow and you do it in the serum little bit ha you know heavier serum like you like more, more like 10 percent of uh, you know bovine serum uh, or fcs and then just kind of grow that the cells will grow but not all cells almost majority of them are not going to form tumors majority of the cancer cells that you make a cell line out of you try to inject them back into the animals they don't form tumors very few do. Now, when it's sort of a misnomer because if you look at the uh, cell lines commercially available, and all commercially available cell lines, they sort of form tumors. So, so general thinking is that okay, you make a cell line from uh, from some patient, and you form a tumor, and you study characterized it. And uh, you know your your odds of getting tumors from those cells is very little. That they may not form. They all form, yes. But see, they are no. They because they made cell line like that. MCF seven was made so that you have so that they can make uh, uh, make tumors. Now what happens in MCF seven majority of you know, people who work on breast cancer work on MCF7 cells. There are so many type, so many you know variations in MCF7 cell that this MCF7 in your lab is not the same MCF7 in my lab. So you know, so if you you could generate results, I generate results, and they don't match, and that doesn't mean that you are wrong or I am wrong. But that's how it just you know it just happens. So in that case, the best thing to do is get a new batch, you buy a new batch from the original stock and get rid of your old stock. Oh, here. So, so as I was telling that in animal models, very few of them, uh, they, they actually form a metastasis here. And uh, in, the, in the patients, the circulating cells are found all the time, but very few will lodge and, and form, the, form metastasis. This is cross, these are the, uh, like for example, you will have breast tumor uh, and also the other tumors will have a brain metastasis occurring. These ones will have a lung or liver or bone. Uh, so in other words, you have a selectivity. The uh, primary site that you have of colon, breast or so long and you can metastatic tumor in these organs and there is a great selectivity. So how does this selectivity uh, occur uh, and the, since you are all plant uh, pathologists uh, you you know plants very well so th this uh, Stephen Paget this theory is very very popular and becoming like extremely popular nowadays is called seed and soil theory so he based his concept on the fact that the uh, the the seeds of a plant goes everywhere, but it forms the uh, you know it forms a tree only at certain places depending on the soil. The word soil that it launches in, and then he transferred that back to the cancer uh, situation. So like here he says that when a plant goes to seed, its seeds are carried all in all directions, but they can only live on congenial soil. And that theory is sort of working out for the cancer also. Like you have a very selectivity in terms of its, uh, its metastatic sites. 
the organs look different histopathologically they have no similarities and yet they go there so and these are the ones that they show that where you have initiation progression metastasis have a regulation by a variety of different uh, molecular uh, pathways and markers that are involved in that and we really won't have time to go into uh, into this aspect it's very fascinating but i won't be able to talk about that uh, that today so let's see go to something that's very important the niche niche cells uh, so the pre metastatic niche so what happens is that the the most fascinating thing which is like a science fiction is that when you have a primary tumor uh, and it's going to start having the cells coming out and going to go to metastasis is go it does it does send it sends a signal to the organ where it's going to have the site where the cell is going to go to that okay you know we are sending some cells prepare the site for their you know for receiving them like you know when i was coming from chicago and doctor brother <laughs> said okay have a guest house ready so something like that and then that's that's true the enormous amount of work in this and we really cannot do that so except for the concept so the primary tumor dictates early changes occurring at sites of future metastasis prior to the arrival of tumor cells they is uh, i mean this is mind boggling how they do that we and there is you know, there like a probably 50 nature and science papers explaining this so uh, this is we all we do is just look at the concept right now and then you can you know if you are interested you can look up the papers so what happens is which leads to the formation of clusters of vgfr and and the supporting proteins at a primary uh, and priming of the tissue the host environment to receive the tumor cells so the signals go to to say lung for a breast cancer if it's going to go to the brain and so okay uh, have the bed ready for the cells to come and they are going to go there and it won't go anywhere else so that's how the metastasis uh, uh, really occur so it's kind of interesting okay so these are the, the way they have shown is for example the this is for the uh, human this is the colon cancer and you look at different sites they were looking at the uh, this the staining of vgf and ck that say uh, remember we kid yesterday we talked about a viral oncogene which becomes a cells tissue oncogene so the kit is one of them so they show in a distant organ they start start forming the the bed essentially by showing the positive reactivity to to the antibodies of vgf and ck so saying that the colon cell is going to go there so what's the advantage the advantage would be uh, that if you which you cannot do but like for example if there is a tumor and if you take the samples maybe you get lucky that you know you might see a staining of some sort in the metastatic distant metastatic site but it's not done usually because it's it's too expensive and and you know how many how many biopsies are you going to take and this is the uh, immunofluorescence of the same type of data okay tumor dormancy is uh, is a new concept where uh, says there were some tumors show metastasis in months but other takes decades so why is that why there is a lag and that's called a tumor dormancy so the, the like tumor cells are detected at distant sites but do not develop metastatic tumor for an indicated time and that's that's called tumor dormancy and there is a regulation for that these are the uh, different dormancy related protocols to show you that. so the summary is the regulatory functions that that we are uh, here, what we cover today we said why angiogenesis is critical vgf is involved growth factors and vgf mmps they help losing the attachment and the ability to attach the uh, other other cell and degrade the matrix metastasis process organ specific metastasis 
they influence the host cells on uh, host organ effect of the tumor cells, seed and soil theory, tumor dormancy, why it's occurring, and uh, we, we hope for the cure, what happens. So we, we have already talked about this, the TNM system. We talked about TNM system before. So here is the real truth about uh, metastasis that of course of 70% of patients may have uh, metastasis already there at the time of diagnosis of a tumor. So what they say is for example in case of breast cancer, uh, this is really my, my old boss in Berkeley who uh, recently passed away but at one time he was just kind of giving a talk and, and, and something that he said really crossed stayed with me is that as well if you have a tumor I mean if you have cancer is bad to have a cancer is bad but if you if you have cancer you pray for having a breast cancer because uh, that is the one that is the most studied and most like you know very efficiently studied the protocols are so standard if you have pancreatic cancer it's not very good it's you know the uh, uh, the drugs don't work, and uh, but the uh, breast cancer is, is, uh, is pretty pretty remarkable that the survival rate is uh, is is very good. So acquisition of the invasive and metastatic phenotype is an early event. Then millions of tumor cells are shed daily in the circulation, but only few reach uh, you know then make it metastasis, and then angiogenesis is an early event that is necessary uh, to promote the metastatic dismanition. Some good news is uh, that uh, both uh, malignant invasion, angiogenesis and metastasis, they use similar hardware. So if you block one, you can block the system. Then very few circulating cells are actually going to cause metastasis, so that's good news. Circulating tumor cells can be uh, directed, uh, detected in patients, but uh, they may still do not have the disease. And um, there are a lot of uh, anti-cancer therapies that are, uh, uh, you know, that that may that may also work on metastasis. The drugs may work both on primary and metastasis. And new therapies are continually being identified for uh, for the process. And uh, the uh, you know we'll just hope for the cure. So that's uh, that's my summary on uh, angiogenesis and metastasis. The reason it was a little bit uh, little bit not you know, not very uh, you, know, you have to follow through the pathways to understand them better. But that we just don't have time. This. Cancer patient is using the drug and the other person is using the same injection for 
means. So, the, yeah, yeah. so it depends on whether the not not the cancer patient, but whether the person's cancer cells have in in that drug. Uh, see, okay. No, drugs are in syringe in needle. Yeah, but see, for example, if a let look at it like this. Say, for example, a person has a breast cancer in very early stage or very you know. Now you're giving the giving the sealing you're, you're injecting the drug. At that time, what's the chance that you're going to have this blood, the cancer cells in circulation at that stage in that moment, right? And then and then it will also be kind of contaminated with the syringe. If you have cancer cells that are that come in into the syringe at that time, well of course then if you use that one it will go into the other person and it can form cancer. But otherwise chances are less. So but data. but uh, sir, uh, as I have seen this line, you are injecting the cancer cell line into the skin of mouse or whatever, uh, what are, whatever way you inject. Still you are injecting the cancer uh, cell lines into the mouse yeah. and then you see the development of uh, that uh, cancer. So it I'm, is injecting, I'm injecting 5 million cells. Okay. For getting that tumor, we have to inject 5 million you know, I mean, if it's a slow growing, it's a five million cell. It's a fast growing tumor. It's a million cell. Now, what's the chance, right? In, in for a drug user, after you inject, inject it, and you're not really taking anything, cutting anything back. So all it is is a contaminated needle that has a point into a cancer patient to have a million cells in that. Almost is impossible. It's not, it cannot even happen. You'll be, you'll be lucky to have five cells, ten cells, right? And those cells are not going to cause I mean, it can, maybe 20 years from now, uh, if, it, if those cells are very aggressive and lock, you know, gets at the proper place and gets at the right target and, and all that. But that is, that's sort of uh, not going to happen. But, but in theory, it can. That's what I'm saying. But as there is excessive angiogenesis in cancer and autoimmune disorders, are the initial symptoms of same in both the cases? Well, the autoimmune disease like AIDS, as I was telling the other day, like you know, you have Kaposi sarcoma and some some of the cancers that come, you know, the the patients with you know the AIDS patients, they usually are very, you know, they they have those. Now, whether the symptoms of having a disease are the same, that I don't know. I I really don't know what. I mean, I know some something about the AIDS, but my knowledge is no better than anybody else on the street. So it's like I really don't know the, the symptoms. I, I really don't know about the symptoms or the but the but the patient, the AIDS patients do get the uh, cancer. They are like Kaposi sarcoma is a, is a true example because that's you know that is very well correlated in in the literature for many many people. So if you permit me, I'll uh, add something to it, uh, this uh, uh, DNA, uh, in, uh, intravasation, extravasation. Okay. I want to add something. Tata Memorial Cancer Center in 2016, uh, while celebrating its 75th anniversary, they showed us, they presented a series of posters and lectures talking about circulating DNA in cancer. So, the, like we are talking about shading cells into the uh, blood vessels and then going out of the blood vessel into a tissue. But they started talking about circulating DNA and this has become a huge concept as of today and they are um, claiming that this particular phenomena is a process is causing relapses and metastasis undergo. And that's true, this, this concept is not really new. That was uh, in 70s, in 79, 1980, uh, there were labs, our, not my lab, but in our institute, there was a guy who formed his own company and he was measuring circular DNAs in the, uh, in the patients, he was getting samples and measuring it and correlating it with the, uh, with the tumors and the metastatic potentials and, um, and you know, trying to get papers and were hard to get it published. Now with molecular biology known so well 
that's becoming more, as you said, it's becoming more, you know, coming more into the light. Concept. But the concept is concept. Concept would have been conceived long time. Cat mosquitoes also transfer cancer cells from one person to another. <laughs> no, 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 I have, I have absolutely no idea. They also, also prick the skin and get prick the blood. Prick the skin, but the, the cancer cell is not on the skin, right? Mm -hmm. Cancer cell is localized in a primary tumor. But they take the blood, so they take the blood. Yeah, but at any given time, the circulating blood doesn't have that kind of cells. I'll give an example. For example, I wanted to develop uh, a, an assay for melanoma patient because we had a benign, uh, you know, the, we had the childhood uh, melanocytic nevus cell line. And what we wanted to do was to see if, if we inject these cells into the mice and then if we collect the blood and then see if we can identify the cells in the blood. So there are uh, enzymes that are, that are known only because melanoma, melanoma is really a neural disease, not a skin disease. So there are some enzymes and biomarkers that are very selective for melanoma. So we, we did, I had a student, we had a, you know, as undergraduate student and we said, okay, why don't we see if we can identify enzyme in this blood cell. And melanoma is known to have blood, you know, melanoma cells in the blood. We cannot identify any sign, we cannot see any cell. Now, if you're talking about any any given time, like for example, first of all, these cells have to continually be circulating in the blood, right? And lots and lots of cells in the blood, that doesn't happen. You, you can have a snapshot when you may be able to see a blood. So it's like uh, you have a time when actually a muscular bite and actually bites at a place where there was a cancer cell at that time and it happened to go, I mean, there are 20 ifs, but I don't, I don't know, it's, that's, a, that's, that's a good hypothetical question. Sir, so, uh, can these uh, cells be used as a bioweapons? Bioweapons? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> We have to get in the army here. Uh, I think that's, uh, that would be unethical. Sir, these are not funny questions. No, it's not. It's a really great question. I mean, that's what I'm saying. That this is really, really good question. Very provocative. Um, and see, for example, uh, what happened to Assad when uh, he was trying to do the chemical weapons, uh, which are bio, bio, weapons in the people and killing his own people and that ethically incorrect or unacceptable thing that you do then the country or that becomes very liable to you know facing the big reward so if you really do a biotech bio weaponization say so you don't have to go to cancer you can uh, you know spread a lot of diseases by uh, which are known that, that, are, that are communicable to plague. You know, why don't we just kind of go ahead and have the plague, uh, you know, in, in the population and or have the tuberculosis. So, that's, you know, that's not, uh, that, that's a little bit, uh, it's just not gonna happen. I mean, at least in my lifetime. Maybe you guys, you're very young. Know. <laughs> Yes, sir, today, in future, when they get out of the country, in the future, when they get out of the country, they get out of the country, they get out of the Every day in our body, we develop a cancer like cells and our immunity kills them, yes. right? So, normally we are all developing cancer per day, mutation in cells, and we are all killing it because of our immunity. Now, someone is going to inject, maybe the immunity is good enough, the person is going to survive. Yeah, I'll tell you one, I'll give you one example. This is really very, 
I mean, it's, it's a funny example, but it's not so funny as you say. Uh, I had a, uh, we had a colleague at our institute. Uh, his name was Chris, Christoph. He is from Russia. And he, you know, he, was a, he later became faculty. He came as a post of older person, MD, PhD. Pretty bright. So what he did is, he took the MCF 7 cells, right? And he injected himself. He, he, he did. And then he, he started taking the pictures, like, you know, it's become red, become, you know, he started taking the picture and he wanted to show the same thing as you're saying, that when you inject the cells, it does not do tumors. And then he wrote an abstract for AACR, you know, American Association of Cancer. They rejected the abstract. He said it's unethical, you cannot do a study like that. But, but he had that, he was, his office was next door, I know. So, you know. People do funny things. Yes. No, 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 no. He's, he's uh, 80 year old and still kicking. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And uh, our blood vessel system is different, and lymphatic system is different, which is taking away all the waste liquids from the species and others. Collecting it and returning back into the blood. Right. So, in angiogenesis, and do the lymphatic system also go side by side or something? No, the, uh, the, the yeah, it will. Like in other words, what happens is the, the angiogenesis process by itself is just making a web. Yeah. Right? And there the, there the lymph is not coming in picture, but uh, the lymph comes in picture when you have the lymphatic system and they. they sort of interact uh, with, with each other. In other words, when the cancer cell gets back into the former tumor and there are lymph nodes around there, so it's going to go into that. But the angiogenesis process by itself doesn't really directly go into the, into the lymph. So, for example, say you have lots of blood vessels which are surrounding the tumor. So now it will have the, the, maybe the cancer cells are going to get into that to go to the distant organ, right? But there the lymph system won't come. Once it goes to that other organ, you will start having the, you know, the, you can you'll start having the lymphs uh, reacting and becoming big and... When the lymph nodes are... Enlarged. Enlarged. Yeah. At that time the lymphatic system... That's when the lymphatic system kicks in. All right.